All right, yeah, so this video is a bit off the cuff. Um, just kind of had a bit of a thought going on recently. And I uh, just kind of want to talk my way through my thoughts here. I got a whole bunch of knives on the table. And uh, what's different about every single one of these is the blade steel that's in there. We got some uh, simple guys like a 440C. Or, uh, yeah, from this uh, Cold Steel Tough Light. This is a... Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is an AUS 8A. Um, they used to use a 420J2, if I remember it. So, that's why I had this one pulled off. I do have uh, one other knife in 420J2 as well. Uh, so, yeah, this is the uh, the Kalashnikov. This is an uh, AUS 8, which uh, is basically the same as AUS 8A. Uh, I believe the A stands for augmented, kind of, uh, you know, a little special splash sort of thing. Uh, let's see. Then we also have uh, Kerchunk. We got 12C27. It's a nice Sandvik steel. Which is okay. But uh, I much prefer uh, the, uh, the better variant of it. 14C28N. Which is kind of built off of the same thing. But uh, done quite a bit differently. We have uh, VG-10, which uh, Spyderco still uses on a ton of their folders. And then, let's see. We can kind of move up maybe a little bit. And this guy's in uh, D2, which uh, seems to uh, be all the rage these days because uh, it's been easy enough to uh, manufacture it cheaply enough. Uh, this is the Artisan Cutlery Shark, but yeah, I have... Many, many, many D2 knives. Um, but yeah, I would kind of glomp that over there with those. Uh, then kind of uh, maybe a little bit higher end, we have uh, 154 CM. Which I still kind of liken to uh, kind of a middle point between VG10 and D2. It's just kind of right around in there. This is the uh, the QSP Gannet, by the way. A little front flipper. And then we get into, uh, well, okay, this one's a little bit uh, odd man out. This is uh, kind of a Damascus etched blade. Uh, this one's from Tucson, but uh, yeah, I have one from uh, Civivi and uh, whatnot as well. Uh, then they're, they're basically like a, uh, the different companies will have different kind of formulations of it. Um, there's almost always a core steel, and then they have the uh, the layers on top of that, and then they acid etch it. But uh, a lot of times it's going to be 9CR18 MOV, which is kind of around uh, this 440C kind of level of performance. Or, you know, in the higher end, uh, VG10. Uh, there is Swedish Dama steel that's uh, highly expensive. So unless you're dropping quite a bit of Benjamins on your knife, it's not going to be that. But there we go. We also have this one here. This is an uh, SK-5. Which, uh, yeah, this is an SE Avispa. Uh, and SK-5, kind of like D2, is a uh, carbon steel. Uh, but this is even more so. Uh, so you really do need to... Uh, uh, keep up on the maintenance on these guys, but they're kind of neat. And, uh, they do have a, uh, a pretty nice advantage that uh, I will get to in a bit here. All right, and that leaves these guys, which are, uh, a little bit fancier in the, uh, the blade steels that they have on them. This is the Benchmade 940. Everybody knows it and loves it, and it's been around for, you know, uh, and forever and a day. This is an, uh, CPM S30V, or which means it's particle metallurgy steel. Uh, and that's been around for uh, quite a while. Uh, this is kind of a newer variant. Uh, this is a cold steel lucky one, but it's in uh, S35VN, which um, uh, helps with the edge retention just a little tiny bit over S30V, but it does um, relieve some uh, machining stress. So it's uh, a little bit easier for uh, companies to uh, manufacture that than S30V. 
And then we have uh, a little bit more exotic stuff. Uh, this one's uh, in CPM crew wear, which is a heck of a lot tougher, but still has kind of a, a really, really good edge retention. Uh, another one from CPM. Uh, we have M4, which, uh, like the SK5, this is uh, a very much a, uh, a uh, carbon steel or... Um, not stainless by any stretch of the imagination. This wheel patina, if you look at it wrong, especially if you get like mustard on it or something like that. So something to keep in mind. But yeah, this is a particle metallurgy uh, tool steel that uh, is supposed to be very, very amazing in edge retention. And uh, that's what I hear from a lot of people. This one in particular from Spyderco. I know I've talked about it before. Um, doesn't exactly hold the edge the absolute best. All right, we have one more CPM steel to get to, and it's this one, uh, CPM S90V, which kind of builds a lot off of these guys, uh, but kind of take it to the extreme. Uh, it can be a little bit brittle uh, because the edge retention is so high because they need to, and uh, they get it a little harder and whatnot, but that can be prone to chipping, but has absolutely fantastic edge holding abilities. This is the uh, the Tucson uh, Fingtooth from uh, Mazlan Mokhtar. Little slip joint kind of guy, shredded carbon fiber, whatever. And then we have uh, the other one that's gotten all sorts of praise and press. Uh, and that is uh, M390. This is a bowler steel. Um, bowler is a... Uh, believe it's an Italian company. Uh, but yeah, and M390 is kind of what a lot of people would consider to be kind of one of the uh, the top high-end steels out there at the moment. Very stain resistant, but also has a lot of edge retention uh, capabilities. Uh, Crucible, the uh, people who make like all of this sort of stuff, uh, also have a version of it called uh, 20CV. And uh, Carpenter, who's another American steel maker, also has a version of it called a, a CTS-204P. You know, a lot of alphabet soup and everything. Certainly happens with all these steels. So, what did I bring up about all of these that um, really uh, kind of got me thinking? And that was... Uh, the different types of steel and uh, kind of what they're designed for and or how it actually goes down in real life. Uh, and this kind of goes back to a lot of the uh, experience that I've had being a uh, knife salesman at, uh, you know, retail locations and uh, malls <laughs> and whatnot uh, that we also did uh, knife sharpening services and uh, everything else with. And that is... The fact that a standard person who buys just a knife, not like the people like us that, you know, have like a billion knives, uh, but the person who's actually, you know, he's just buying it as a tool. Like, I want a good knife. They're going to buy it. And probably to them, it's really not going to matter that much about the steel. And I say that because... Most people who buy them as tools aren't knife enthusiasts. They don't have the uh, the necessary skills to be able to sharpen knives. Most of the time, they don't even have um, the, the tools or utilities uh, available to actually do any of that sharpening. So for them, I think that uh, some of these more expensive, uh, fancier blade steels, maybe not this guy, <laughs> uh, would probably suit them better because they're not going to be maintaining their knives because they don't have the tools to do so and the knowledge to be able to do it in a, a decent fashion. So they're going to use the knife and not maintain it to the point where it becomes a butter knife and then, hey, maybe they might uh, be able to talk their friend into a sharpener for them or uh, sending it out to uh, some place to get it sharpened or whatnot. And uh, that's great and everything. And I think that probably helps with uh, some of those folks. 
Also, if they are kind of maybe, uh, because they, yeah, sorry, because they're not sharpening their own knives, it really doesn't matter how difficult a knife is to sharpen because they're not going to be doing it. They're going to either be paying somebody else to do it or just not at all. So there you go. Uh, and as far as like a lot of us knife enthusiasts, uh, when we do maintain our knives quite a bit, you know, we know how to sharpen at least to some extent or whatnot, um, and do all that sort of maintenance and everything like that. Um, in those particular circumstances, I wouldn't say absolute dirt cheap steel, you know, like a 440C or like 420J2 or something like that. Probably set those guys out. But I think... A little bit more of the uh, the non-powdered steel might be better suited for us. Now, yeah, we, um, you know, as far as edge retention sort of stuff goes, like I understand uh, a lot of the bragging rights in the knife community. It's kind of like having uptime if you're, uh, you know, a Linux admin or something like that on the uh, <laughs> the the PC side. But the fact of the matter is these steels are much easier to maintain and to sharpen than their particle metallurgy um, brethren do. And that would go to show that as long as you have a knife that will be able to get through a full, day, a full day's work, which maybe not 12C27, but uh, 14C28N, yes. VG10, yes. 154CM, yes. D2, yes. SK5, sure, why not? It's a little bit of a different steel out there. Um, I mean, cold steels use it in quite a few fixed blades, but not really so much in the way of folders. But hey, it's out there. Uh, that, they, it might make a little bit more sense to uh, kind of go for these steels because they're a lot easier to maintain. You don't really have to uh, spend quite as long if you want to do uh, hand sharpening on any of these things. And uh, because we do have the, the ability and the interest to be uh, maintaining them, it might suit us better to have, you know, kind of middle-of-the-road steels rather than spending a whole lot of money on the really exotic stuff. And don't get me wrong, I love my exotics. Uh, all those uh, particle metallurgy steels are super neat. They have a really, really fine carbide uh, distribution and everything like that. But... They can be an amazing pain in the ass to sharpen. Uh, for me, myself, I have struggled for years to uh, be able to sharpen uh, S30V to a, uh, a very, very nice degree. I've gotten there now with, uh, you know, kind of modern day tools and whatnot. But, um, yeah, for a very, very long time, it was very difficult for me to uh, maintain that sort of stuff. This, as well as a... Uh, Spyderco Manix 2 XL that I've had forever in uh, S30V. Uh, I'd struggled a lot uh, trying to uh, keep those sharp. And I haven't really had that problem uh, nearly as much with like uh, a couple of knives I have in S35VN. That seems to be a little bit easier for me. Um, M390 really hasn't given me too much of a problem, but uh, that might also have another thing to do with um, M390 being... Uh, Fairly difficult and uh, different to heat treat than a lot of other steels, so some companies don't exactly do the best job at it. Unfortunate, but that's kind of how it is. You know, uh, you know a, a blade steel is only as good as its heat treat. You know, it, it's pretty much the way it goes. You can have a really, really soft um, M390, or uh, hey, as I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, S90V blade that's supposed to have amazing blade um, edge retention, yet if they're not actually properly heat treated, they kind of suck. They hold their edge a little bit more like D2, but they're much more difficult to sharpen for that same kind of performance there. So yeah, this is just kind of me thinking the other day that, uh, you know, like I, I am all for pushing the industry, doing, uh, you know, different steels, M4, crew wear, uh, S90V, all that sort of, uh, new fancy stuff. I do love all of that stuff quite a bit. 
But as a knife collector and someone who occasionally uses knives for, uh, you know, all those cutting tasks and everything like that, uh, I don't necessarily need all of, uh, all of the edge retention in the known universe to be packed into that steel. Whereas it might be in my better interest, time-wise, if I went for a more middle-of-the-road, easier-to-maintain steel. I don't know, just kind of something I was thinking about. Uh, obviously, the uh, the more fancy knives up here and everything like that uh, do cost more money. But I suppose if uh, someone was out there and they're just looking for, you know, a really nice knife because, well, they're only going to have one. And it's going to be like their tool for work or something like that. And they uh, they spend, you know, a bit more money if they actually understand that, uh, you know, these things can have a lot more value to them and whatnot. Then, uh, you know, that uh, works out for them. They're not selling a whole bunch of knives to that one particular customer. But they've sold one at a premium. Whereas a lot of these, much cheaper. So you can uh, be a little bit crazy like me and just pick up, you know, many, 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 many knives. And, uh, you know, I do like uh, variety and uh, different manufacturing uh, techniques and uh, companies and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah, I, I do it for kind of the, uh, the interest in it and everything like that. And, uh, yeah, I absolutely love my particle metallurgy steel. But the logical part of my head says, I don't need it. Whereas somebody who doesn't have the skills, uh, equipment, or know-how how to maintain a knife would probably benefit them more from having a, uh, a fancier steel that holds its edge a lot longer. Because for them, it's going to be safe and sharp much longer than if they picked up one of these uh, more middle-of-the-road steels. I don't know, just kind of an interesting thought. I don't know. What do y'all think? Uh, you know, feel free to uh, drop me any kind of uh, information down below, whether or not you, uh, you have a particular steel that you like or you don't like or you've had difficulties sharpening or, uh, or anything like that. I'm just kind of interested in uh, what, what kind of goes on out there in the... Uh, in the rest of that knife community. So, uh, yeah. All right. This was just kind of a uh, thought piece, but, uh, yep. Yeah, as always, I appreciate y'all for watching and, uh, have yourself a wonderful rest of your day. Yo.